I'm voting for opportunity. I'm voting for mobility. I'm voting for communities. I'm voting for the environment. Calgary's Municipal Election Day is Monday, October 16th. Learn more at electionscalgary.ca. I'm so confused. broken heart is a part of your plan when i try to pray all i got is her and these four words thy will be done thy will be done thy will be done having so much fun today, aren't we? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we come before you, we praise you, we worship you, and we thank you for the opportunity to meet here in peace and safety and 
the chance to learn more about you. And we ask for your blessings on all the proceedings. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the model play... <laughs> In the model prayer in Matthew, there is a phrase that says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if someone asked you, What is God's will on earth? And what is God's will for you? What would you say? Okay, you guys got to get used to pop quizzes. Love. Pardon me? Love. Love. Accept Christ. Accept Christ. Turn from evil. Turn from evil. Repent. <laughs> Same thing. Okay. Come on, you guys. You're supposed to be prepared to, get, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Win the lottery. Win the lottery. <laughs> yeah. You're from, you're from St. Albert. Don't you know the people that won last week? Oh, they're from Yellowhead County. They're from Oh. Oh, well. I don't know that. Okay. John 10, verse 10 says... I have come that you might have life abundantly. Oh, the TV's not on. Um, where was I? Other translations say, more than they dreamed of, life to the full, life in all its fullness. All the rest of that is captured in there. Personal salvation, loving relationships, renewed human community, justice for all, breaking the power of sin, life in all its fullness. The world was created because God loves life. He loves to bless life and enjoy life. We were created because God wanted to love and bless us. How many of you have gardens in the summer? Do you plant gardens because you love pulling weeds? <laughs> of course not. We plant gardens beautiful flowers or growing vegetables unfortunately weeds come up and we have to pull them to ensure the garden's growth will not be hindered God did not create the world so we would have a bunch of problems to fix just so he could keep himself busy God didn't create us to need fixing but Adam and Eve made a decision that produced weeds lots and lots of weeds God gave us the Ten Commandments why so we couldn't have fun no, because he knew greed and immorality were weeds, obstacles to experiencing life's fullness. God is not obsessed with morality. He's obsessed with love and life to its fullest. Morality is merely a means to the end. Morality, salvation, social justice, all are about fixing problems, pulling weeds. We weren't faced with pain and problems, adultery, stealing, murder, Caused by ours and other people's immoral behavior, we wouldn't be concerned about it. Something has gone wrong with this world, and morally it has to be put right. I mean, look what happened in Las Vegas this week. I mean, how do you even fathom, fathom a mind that would do something like that? Salvation is only relevant if someone needs to be saved, right? Salvation is about putting lives right again. There is no doubt that Jesus was involved in all these causes, but if he had his choice, they wouldn't have need fixing in the first place. But he left the choice to man, and Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. And since then, our battles with sin, injustice, and immorality are like pulling weeds. We need to remove the obstacles to growing in the fullness of life. What would this world have been like if Adam and Eve had made the right choice? I mean, there was only two choices. You ever thought of that? Kind of interesting. Love and blessings are not things that have a maximum fill level called perfection, and that's where we stay. No, it's like, oh, whoops, I shouldn't have had that third kid. I didn't realize I didn't have any love left for it. <laughs> that's ridiculous. You know, love is something that grows and matures and flourishes, always changing and evolving. God's goal for the human race is not just that we avoid sin, it is for there to be an explosion of goodness and joy and love. The fullness of life that Jesus came to give us access to is like that. It is a diverse, refreshing, exuberant life in which we are ever increasingly aware and appreciative of the beauty and joy and magical fullness of any given moment. Psalm 16, verse 11. You have made known to me the path of your life. You fill me with the joy in your you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. 
John 15, 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Other translations say your joy will overflow. Unfortunately, we live in a fence in our mind. We want to stay where it's safe, away from opportunity and growth. The result is a struggle between the parts of us that longs for something new and the parts of us that fear the unknown. Fear, establish, fear establishes limits in our lives. If you're afraid of heights, you'll stay low. If you're afraid of people, you'll stay alone. If you feel fear failure, you simply won't try. We hate not knowing what is coming next. It's not that as Christians we shouldn't be concerned or scared, but we should react differently to the uncertainty of the unknown because our hope is centered in Christ. 21 times Jesus said, fear not or take courage or something like that. The great commandment of love God and your neighbor was only recorded eight times. Guess God really knew humans. I mean, look at the Israelites. God saved them from slavery, but they were so afraid of the unknown, they wanted to return to Egypt, even after witnessing so many miracles, food, water, their fear came from not trusting God would take care of them. They did not trust God. We trust God with our eternity, but do we trust God with tomorrow? Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. That implies that we can't always trust our own mind and understanding because it's been affected by the pattern of the world. God is a lot more reliable than our understanding. Look at the patterns God set. Give up your life to get it. The greatest among you is like a servant. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's so not what the world believes. Many other kingdoms they look for. But if you seek first the kingdom of wealth, you'll sweat every dollar. If you seek first the kingdom of health, you'll freak out over every ache and twinge. If you seek first the ki kingdom of physical beauty, you'll be swayed by every diet and exercise and fashion craze that comes along. If you seek first the kingdom of popularity, you'll relive every conflict over and over in your mind. If you seek first the kingdom of safety, you'll spook at every creak and groan and live behind bars. But seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and you will find it. God does not have a secret plan for our life, but he's not going to tell us what it is we have to guess. That's just plain silly. We don't have to be... There's lemon in there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to be paralyzed by decisions, being afraid we made the wrong one, or we'll be stuck and have to live out the consequences of getting God's will wrong. God's will is not some sort of specific path we're supposed to follow, or direction we're supposed to go and it's out there somewhere and we're supposed to keep looking and searching. He doesn't have a secret path just for you and that he's keeping from you. We grow, we mature, we transform, and when we have to make choices, we exercise judgment and take responsibility. There is no shortcut in life for this. There is no shortcut to maturity. God's will is not a way of escaping the anxiety and responsibility of making decisions. We can't sit around waiting for lightning bolts from heaven to show you God. Have you heard people say, I don't know what God's will is for me. What should I do? This is fueled by a focus on trying to please God. Believe it or not, trying to please God is not his will for us because we think we can please God on our own by doing works for him, by conquering our sins on our own. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Trust in God, believing I am who God says I am, that God didn't design us to conquer sin our own, on our own. We need to learn a life where we lean on God's grace rather than trying to journey alone to reach him. God wants us to rely on him for everything. So pleasing God is actually a byproduct of trusting God. Our acceptance and love is slavery. Living from, exist, ex, living from acceptance and love is freedom. 
Does God care if you become a doctor, a mechanic, an accountant, or a stay-at-home mom? Well, yes and no. God gives us all talents and wants us to use them. So before we go on, let's look at some definitions. A talent is something you are born with. It naturally exists within you and cannot be acquired. They are naturally recurring patterns of thought, feeling, or behavior that can be productively applied. Talents are inborn predispositions, things that you do instinctively and that naturally give you satisfaction. So what does a talent look like? It can be a natural tendency to pick up on people's emotions, pressure, make others laugh, enjoy puddles, puzzles, be competitive, envision and clearly articulate a future scenario. Skills are basic abilities to move through the fundamental steps of a task. They can be acquired by formal or informal training, like learning to do a PowerPoint, something I had to do for making sermons. <laughs> Knowledge is simply what you know. It can be factual, things you've learned through training, or experiential, been there, done that. Knowledge could tell you how to deal with an upset customer, how to cope with job-related stress, on the fastest route to the grocery store. The difference between the three is talents are inborn. Skills and knowledge can be acquired, but they are situation-specific. They can be acquired, but they will not significantly help you unless they enhance a talent. Our talents remain constant. Take Paul, for example. When he was Saul, he was stubborn, single-minded, single -minded, and zealous in his attacks on Christians. After his conversion, Paul was stubborn, single-minded, single -minded, and zealous in his defense of Christianity. What changed after his conversion was his values. Instead of using his talents to hunt and persecute Christians, he used them to seek and convert non-Christians. The same talents that made him a formidable enemy of the church were now making him an invaluable champion. The fundamental building block of any strength is talent. When you enhance a talent by adding right skills and useful knowledge, you have created a strength. A strength is the ability to provide consistent, near-perfect performance activity. So figure out your talents and acquire knowledge and skills to enhance them. Isn't that part of your job as a parent, to figure out what your kids are good at and encourage them to grow and expand in those areas? So one Bible study we did, we had to identify our strengths. What happens in a small group stays in a small group, but I have asked permission to share a few things. We have some lively discussion. Let's just say it's not a subdued Bible study. Jean was notorious for, how should I put this, disagreeing with a lot of things in the workbook and for leaving his homework till the last minute. So, Keeping me in line, okay, right. So this particular evening, he came in complaining about the questions in the exercise, that they were repetitive, and there was something wrong with it because his greatest strength was, are you ready for this? Harmony. <laughs> All our jaws hit the table and we laughed for five minutes. But in the following weeks, as we worked through the meaning of the strengths, it turned out to be true. Betty's top strength, on the other hand, is motivator. Now that's just a polite way of saying nagger. <laughs> one of the assignments that we had to do in Vantage Point One was to have three different one-hour intentional spiritual conversations with someone. A few weeks before the assignment, we were told to pray about it to see who God wanted us to talk to. The only name that God put in my head was Betty. Now, one of my weeks is that I hate meeting new people. I know you don't believe me, but really, you don't want me a greeter at the door. You're gonna have people running out screaming. Now, I didn't know Betty. I'd only ever said hi to her a few times, and let's face it, she's old. <laughs> anyway, as my small group facilitator said, if that's who God put in your head, you better go talk to her. So I approached her and I said, look, I have this assignment for my Bible study, and I need to have intentional, yes, uh, but you don't know what it is. I don't care, I want to do it. So. We had our conversations, and they were more like three hours long, and after that, she became my personal nagger. Other people get personal shoppers. I got a personal nagger. I mean, motivator. And she started on me right away. We need to do this Bible study here. There was a lot of reasons why, we, why not. The training was expensive. I'd have to take a week off work, travel there, stay in a hotel. Lots of really good reasons. And one day at church, when I was listing off all these really good reasons, Betty walked off and came back with Pastor Bob and said, 
this training and I think the church should pay for it. And Bob said, okay, don't you hate that when all your excuses get knocked down? <laughs> so I thought I better do something about it. So I went online and, and I looked it up and there it was. In two months time, the training was gonna be in Edmonton on a weekend. I just remember sitting there thinking, oh God, what are you doing? I can't lead a Bible study. So I took the training. There are no coincidences. That was the one and only time there was the training in Edmonton. So it was a very hairy year because I was leading year one of uh, Vantage Point and taking year three with my other small group. And back then the Bible study was more geared to um, developing church leaders. Now it's more about personal growth. But back there at the end of year three, you could take a test online and get a lay pastor certificate, which one of the ladies in my group did. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. It's not like I'm ever going to be a leader or give sermons or anything. <laughs> Doesn't God have a sense of humor? So when God was telling me it's time to give sermons, there's Betty. If, what, if God wants you to do this, you better do it. It's really hard to uh, argue with a personal negative. So I remember saying, God, this is ridiculous. You've forgotten who you're talking to. This is Christine, and I can't give sermons. And he pats me on my pointy little head and said, oh, you're so cute when you worry about me, and of course you can't give sermons. That's the whole point. So I said, well, this is, if this is really from you, I want a sign. I want a really big sign. And he gave me one a few days later. I stood there with my mouth hanging open, and then I started to laugh, and I said, can I be like Gideon and ask for a second sign? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so, where was I? Okay, back to strengths. So my greatest strength, I know you might find this hard to believe, especially if you played cards with me, <laughs> is competition. Now, this doesn't seem like a good thing, because all strengths have their downsides if you don't use them properly. But someone who is competitive brings energy to a group and they push others to achieve more. My second strength is I'm an achiever. I have to achieve something tangible every day. I'm highly motivated and I push for higher excellence. I am responsible. I take ownership of anything I commit to. And because of that, I really think things over before I do commit. Here, I do things. I don't just talk about them. Action is the best chance for learning. There's no need for detailed planning because once you start down a path, you're going to hit obstacles, so most of your plans are useless anyway. Which is really funny because I used to have a poster for years hanging in my bedroom that said, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And the last of my top strengths is communication. The ability to turn events into stories, to teach, to, to search for the perfect phrase, and to inspire people to act. Well, dang. Would you look at all that? As Pastor Bob puts it, the ability to pat you on the head and kick you on the butt at the same time. <laughs> we all go through different phases in our life. I mean, I thought leading songs was scary. This is worse. And sometimes you get a glimpse of your future phase and it's like, oh, I'm just him for a while, okay? Do you know what your strengths are? Unfortunately, we live in a rush society where people don't stop to analyze themselves. From a spiritual viewpoint, when we deny our talents and instead focus on building up our weaknesses, on some level we are telling God that we know best and somehow God made a mistake in gracing us with our unique mix of talents. Naming our top talents gives us permission to accept our areas of lesser talents and either discard them or manage them. Our weaknesses are there so that as we live in community, someone else's strengths will shore up our weaknesses and balance things out. That's how God teaches us to love and depend on each other. We bring up the next slide. I recommend getting this, living your strengths, discovering your talents. You can get it on Amazon for about 25 bucks. And it comes with a computer code where you go online and you take the strength finder test and it tells you your top five strengths. And the book is excellent. There's about 34 different talents that they um, that they identify and that tells you what they're good for and how you can use them. Um, the authors say that the chance of meeting someone with the top five signature themes are less than one in 275,000. And there's only one chance in 33 million that you will find somebody who has the same top five themes in the same order. 
God has made us unique. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. God planned exactly how he wanted you to serve him, and then he shaped you for those tasks. God never wastes anything. He did not give you all your abilities unless he intended you to use them for his glory. In the parable of the talents, God gave one servant five talents, one servant two talents, and one servant one talent. We all get different abilities. The servants with five and two talents doubled them, but the one with one talent just buried his. And the master was angry because he wanted the servant to take a risk and grow his talent. We have to take risks or we will never grow. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. John 17, verse 4. Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Jesus brought glory to God by fulfilling his purpose on earth. God wants you to be you. God wants us to be who he created us to be, not what we think we should be. God's will for me is to be the best Christine Schultz there is. What is God's will for you? Back to the question, does God care if you become a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker? Yes, because he wants you to use the talents he's given you, and no, because your talents can lead to numerous careers. If you're good at math, you can become an accountant, an engineer, a teacher. You get to choose. God is more concerned about your motivation. Do you pick this career so you can be down on others, or do you think you can be successful and use your success to help others? The motivation behind decisions. Being successful and fulfilling your life's purpose are not the same thing. You can have lots of money and importance, but if you don't use it to glorify God, it's meaningless. 1 Corinthians 13 is a whole chapter dedicated to showing that if, you, that lo if love isn't our motivation, it's all meaningless. God's will is about who we are, not what we are. It's about simply trusting him, which is not that simple. What area of your life are you not trusting God with? If you say none, you really don't know yourself that well. We all struggle. God's will is your growth in Christ-likeness. Sorry, there are no 12 steps. The moment you think you have God's will all figured out with nice, neat lines and definitions, you are no longer dealing with God's will. You have to walk into the unknown without any specifics. Christianity is not a solitary journey. How can you learn to love when you are a solitary Christian? We do not get enough community from just attending church. You need to be in a small group for the support and growth opportunity. You will have no idea how spending a few hours with like-minded people discussing spiritual matters nourishes your soul until you do it. It's a quote from Blaine Smith. Any serious endeavor to know God's will should be an isolated effort but shared with other Christians. If my commitment to Christ is inseparable from my commitment to other believers, then I must not expect to understand his will fully apart from being in relationship with other Christians, and I should expect that he will often convey his will to, to me through others. Satan loves detached believers, unplugged from the life of the body, isolated from God's family, and unaccountable to spiritual leaders because he knows they are defenseless and powerless against his tactics. Hey, if I can give sermons, you can host a small group. There are thousands of great Bible studies out there. God has created hundreds of people with the talents to teach through different mediums. Why aren't you using what God provided? All you need is enough chairs, plugs to go around, and a TV and a DVD player. You can schedule your small group to meet, fit your circumstances. Meet once a week, twice a month, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever works for you. And don't handpick your group. We don't have to agree with everyone on every teeny little detail. Community has nothing to do with compatibility. Everyone has quirks and annoying habits. Yes, even you, Mark. That's how we learn to love as God loves. 
We are all here by God's grace. Grace is believing that against all odds and past history, we are loved and chosen, and we do not have to get it all together. It's not the absence of trouble, but the presence of God that sets us apart from this world. So if you just felt God give you a nudge, as Betty would say, if that's what God wants, wants you to do, you better do it. Come up afterwards and let me know if you would like to host or would like to join a small group. You don't have to be afraid. It's not a lifetime commitment. It can be a one-study commitment. Most small groups last about three to five years because if they don't have significant changes, they get stagnant. My Tuesday group has lasted seven years because each year somebody drops out and two people join in, so there's always a different dynamic. There's tons of Bible studies in the library and there's lots of resources out there. So what are you waiting for? God wants you to have a more abundant life. Make the decision to have it. Start doing your part. It's not going to fall on your head. Oh, that reminds me. Your homework assignment. Who wasn't here when I gave my last sermon? August. Ooh, a few of you. Okay, so I, I gave and after I gave it out, somebody came up to me and af afterwards and said, oh, when I heard the word homework, I thought, oh, more stuff I have to do. I'm not going to name names, but this is from somebody whose major strength is harmony. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is it. It's been, what, eight weeks? So it's time to pick five more people. So what I want you to do is look around, pick five people that are close to you, that you're not related to, and person one you play, pray for on Mondays, person two on Tuesdays, person three on Wednesdays, etc., etc. And I mean really pray, not say, God bless Jim, help him to make it to his 81st birthday, and God bless Joyce, help him to put up with him for another year. <laughs> okay, so like, put some effort into it, because we, we get into the bad habit of just praying for people when they're we're supposed to be a community and supporting each other, so we should be praying for each other when we're not in trouble. I don't know if you're going to do this, but God will. God does not expect you to save the world. That's his job. But we should be doing our little part. We aren't called to save the world's problems on our own, but we can do something. Sometimes when we see the great needs of the world, we can get overwhelmed and start to wonder if our small contribution really makes that much of a difference. If we serve out of love and devotion to Jesus, our meager efforts will be remembered by the one who does have the power to change the world. Sometimes God's will for you often boils down to doing the next best loving thing. Not arguing, letting someone into your lane, giving somebody a cup of water, a clothes. Acts 13 verse 36 says, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. Are we serving God's purpose in this generation? What has God told you to do that you haven't started doing yet? God gave us all unique mix of talents for a reason. Only you can fulfill God's will for you. Do you trust God enough to use the talents he gave you? Health is no excuse. Age is no excuse. Nowhere in the Bible does it say when you get old you can stop growing. What a lousy example that is for our kids or grandkids. I love the example of Nellie. No, I can't remember her last name. Like, she was 93 when she had to move out of her home and into a senior's home, and she really hated it. But she said, you know what? One month after she moved in, she knew why God had put her there. Isn't that a great example? What is your unique contribution to the building of God's kingdom? God wants you to serve him passionately, not dutifully. So this week, while I was trying to figure out how to end the sermon, I picked up Rick Warren's book and read the chapter, Accepting Your Assignment. So I thought, how many of you read this? Seriously? Um, the Purpose Driven Life. Okay. Okay, so, so there are no coincidences with God. Oh, great. I can't read this here. <laughs> yeah, it's long enough. Okay. <laughs> so, this is from Accepting Your Assignment, Chapter 21. You were put on earth to make a contribution. You were created to add to life on earth, not just take from it. You're not saved by service, but you are saved for service. 
if I have no love for others, no desire to serve others, and I'm only concerned about my needs, I should question whether Christ is really in my life. A saved heart is the one that wants to serve. Ooh, I love this guy. He really doesn't pull punches, does he? We are healed to help others. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are saved to serve, not to sit around and wait for heaven. Anytime you use your God-given abilities to help others, you are fulfilling your calling. Jesus came to serve and to love, to serve and to give. And those two verbs should identify your life on earth. Study without service leads to spiritual stagnation. The mature follower of Jesus stops asking, who's going to meet my needs, and starts asking, whose needs can I meet? When's the last time you asked yourself that question? One day, God will compare how much time and energy we spend on ourselves compared with what we invested in serving others. At that point, all our excuses for self-centeredness will sound hollow. I was too busy, or I had my own goals, or I was preoccupied with working, having fun, or preparing for retirement. To all excuses, God will respond, sorry, wrong answer. I created, saved, and called you and commanded you to be live a life of service. What part did you not understand? If you aren't serving, you're just existing because life is meant for ministry. If you're not involved in any service or ministry, what excuse have you been using? Abraham was old, Jacob was insecure, Leah was unattractive, Joseph was abused, Moses stuttered, Gideon was poor, Samson was codependent, Rahab was immoral, David had an affair and all kinds of family problems, Elijah was suicidal, Jeremiah was depressed, Jonah was reluctant, Naomi was a widow, John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least, Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered, Martha worried a lot, the Samaritan woman had several failed marriages, Zacchaeus was unpopular, Thomas had doubts, Paul had poor health, and Timothy was timid. This is quite a variety of misfits, but God used each of them in his service. He will use you too if you stop making excuses. Now here's a quote from C.S. Lewis. There are two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. So God's plan for winning the whole world is to make each person he touches magnetic enough with love to draw others in. So what if things go wrong? Like this, this song, how can our pain be a part of your plan? She wrote that song after she miscarried at eight months. Well, Mark told me I only have 30 minutes, so we'll have to talk about that next time. So God wants us to have a list. It's there. It's yours for the choosing. God puts before you life and death. Choose life. Choose the more abundant life. Let's pray. God, you are so awesome and so great, and you hold this whole world in the palm of your hands. And your thoughts are above our thoughts. Your ways are so above our ways. Yet you see us, and you hear us, and against all odds, you love us. Father, teach us to love as you love us, and help us to be conduits of that love, Father, to be examples to this world and to show people what being a Christian really is. And help us to remember to put your will first, and to remember that you are God, and I am not. We ask this in Amen.